our, our panelists, but one of the things I want to do is introduce to our panelists our students. And these are our students, sorry for the lights, they're for uh, the camera. This is going to be televised on channel 36. Uh, if you have cable in LA, you will be getting it. Uh, all households in Los Angeles, irrespective of what uh, uh, cable franchise you're part of, if you get DirecTV, you're not going to get this. So that's one of the bad things about DirecTV, you don't get uh, some of these access channels. Um, these are students from a variety of different classes, political science, urban studies, economics, public policy, uh, all here interested to hear about uh, direct democracy and the role of uh, ethnicity in, in new American cities. Uh, we had an earlier panel where we talked a lot about uh, the, the conventional democratic reforms and other ways of participation. Uh, today, uh, right now in this panel, we're going to focus a lot more on race and ethnicity, and it's actually quite opportune given what we've been seeing not only in Los Angeles, but in Phoenix, Dallas, and cities throughout uh, the United States, even in cities where you wouldn't think this would be going on, like Seattle and uh, Atlanta and places of, of that sort. And so we'll have a lot of that discussion. Um, what we really want to focus on is the new emerging coalitions and the new e emerging ways of uh, democratic expression and a lot of the institutional obstacles that also uh, prevent uh, participation in, in certain manners. Um, what I want to do first off though is instead of me introducing the panelists, if we could have each panelist just, uh, not just, not the first name, but the, um, your actual uh, name affiliation and some of the research or issues that you've been studying uh, and looking at lately so we can just get, the students can get a sense of uh, who you are and where you're coming from and then we'll a start asking some questions and, and see in, in terms of some uh, uh, presentation. So, Melinda, why don't we start with you? Okay. My name is Melina Abdullah. Um, okay, is this better? Okay. My name is Melina Abdullah. I'm a professor of Pan African Studies at Cal State LA and an adjunct professor in political science at USC, since I know I have some of my USC students here. Um, my area of research really kind of focuses around, I was thinking about how to, how to kind of synthesize this because I have a lot of stuff that I do and I felt like I was all over the place. But what it kind of centers around is really how um, power allocation can be shifted, the use of social movements and shifting power allocation. And um, there's a couple of things that I look at. Um, leadership and leadership forms. Um, non-traditional forms of participation and then sites of potential movement building. So what that's played out in terms of actual research or how that's played out in terms of actual research projects is projects on local politics, racial politics, women in politics, and um, the area that I've published the most in is in hip hop and politics. Um, and my most recent research um, actually looks at um, black politics in California since 1965 and ways in which um, both electoral politics and then protest politics have kind of worked together. And um, what my co-author and I try to do is kind of build a framework for the new black politics, um, which is different than the way Pearson and some others kind of conceptualize it. We say that it's group-centered. Um, there's a group-centered leadership style. Um, there's collectivist goals. And then um, it's also kind of coalitional. So we have to build coalitions with other folks who are similarly situated. Ruth, can I get you to use? I'm Ruth Galanter. I'm the non-academic on this panel. Uh, despite that, I actually am here at LMU this year as, I have the coolest title in the world, Distinguished Scholar for Los Angeles Urban Research. Um, but I'm really here because I spent 16 years as a member of the Los Angeles City Council and actually represented this area for 15 years out of the 16. Uh, I've probably represented more different parts of the city than anyone else who has not held citywide office because my district has been moved, was moved twice uh, in reapportionment, which as you know happens every 10 years after the census. So when I started, I represented a district that was roughly 60% Anglo and about 30% African American, uh, but with a Latino population relatively small but sprinkled throughout the district. I finished up 15 years later with a district that was 71% Latino, mostly recent immigrants, had almost no African Americans, um, and the rest of them were middle class whites. Um, I have been through 
uh, on a day-to-day -day basis about every stereotype you can imagine regarding the different ethnic groups and the interests of different ethnic groups in here in Los Angeles. And I can tell you many stories to prove how inaccurate nearly all of those stereotypes turn out to be, especially the ones that uh, deal with somebody's perception of what somebody else is interested in. Uh, I don't do formal research on it, but I have plenty of anecdotal stuff to supply to everybody else on the panel and all of you. Thank you, Ruth. Ricardo? Hi. Uh, my name is Ricardo Ramirez. I'm an assistant professor of political science and American studies and ethnicity at uh, USC. And uh, I'll use this time to plug our upcoming book. Uh, my, the, the area of interest that I have has a, a lot to do with immigrants and the, the book that, w that we, I co-edited with some others, uh, with Teku Lee and Karthik Ramakrishnan, uh, is titled Transforming Politics, Transforming America, so that will be available in the summer. Uh, yeah, they're all going to run out and uh, uh, get, get that first cover <laughs> book. It's uh, $60 a... Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, that encapsulates a lot of the work that I've been working on uh, with others on uh, political incorporation of racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, that one specifically deals with the political incorporation of immigrants. Um, uh, some of the other work that I've done has dealt with the, the effects of political context on political behavior, electoral and otherwise, uh, specifically on Latinos in California. I've also done a lot of work on elite uh, nonpartisan mobilization efforts of Latinos and other communities. And I'm moving now into an arena of looking at the, the effects of residential mobility uh, in politics, specifically on how that affects mobilization, participation, and obviously political incorporation. So that's, that's my areas of interest at this point. Uh, Otto. Thank you. Uh, I'm Otto Santana, and I'm uh, uh, not a political scientist. I'm uh, a linguist. I'm at UCLA in Chicana and Chicano Studies. And I guess I've been brought here because some of the work that I've done is in how uh, political concepts are presented in the mass media, in the media news. In, effect, in particular, I looked at how Latinos were represented and immigrants were represented during the 1990s uh, in uh, the Los Angeles Times during, uh, for example, Proposition 187. And I can compare that to the, and what I will do today is present how that, those images of 12 years ago compare to uh, the images that we understand today that we're seeing on the street today. How 400,000 people in the streets in 1994 uh, are represented and how they're represented now in 2006. Thank you. Michael. Hi, I'm Mike Latner. I'm a doctoral student at, down the road at UC Irvine. My interests are in political geography and comparative urban politics. And the, uh, what I'm speaking on today is social capital and diversity. Part of my research, my current research interests include an international project studying the effects of globalization on metropolitan living patterns and their political consequences. Um, part of that has to do, of course, with immigration patterns and how immigration patterns and different living patterns more generally lead to disparities in political resources and contribute to political inequalities, uh, which then contributes to political polarization and extremism. And our very own Dr. Mara Marks. Yeah, Mara Marks, I'm in the Urban Studies program here at LMU, and I've got some students here in the room, so um, hopefully I don't screw up too badly. Um, my, uh, I guess my main area of research is the politics of land use, and um, I've done some research about specific neighborhoods and um, um, big infrastructure projects and uh, housing development in Los Angeles. And um, one of the projects that I'm interested in right now that's um, kind of um, creating a basis of a little bit of an obsession for me right now is home ownership as a basis of um, political identity, social identity, and how home ownership um, might transcend other forms of, or other bases of, of identity, like race and ethnicity and other ways that we typically 
see people lining up in big cities, that in fact home ownership might be a new um, um, basis of um, identity that we need to take a closer look at. Well, let me explore that a little bit more with you. What you're basically saying, um, since I've read most of her stuff, but uh, what you're saying is that uh, once a Latino, African American, or Asian American uh, purchases a home, they begin to uh, act differently politically. Yeah, I mean, they're, um, you know, we typically look at big cities like Los Angeles and we think that there are these, you know, cleavages that divide people up and we can kind of predict the way people view the world and think about the world and the way they act politically um, on the basis of their um, race and ethnicity, their where they live, their geography, maybe even their um, partisan identification. Um, and I am beginning to suspect, and um, my um, colleague in the audience, Matt Barreto, um, and Stephen Nunez, um, Nuno, we've been um, looking at some of these questions, and it looks like, actually, as you become a homeowner, that um, not only are you more um, um, upbeat than renters, which is kind of um, something that we would find to be pretty obvious, but that um, your racial identity in many aspects starts to um, differentiate you from, you know, less than just your, your identity as a homeowner. There is something about being a homeowner um, that um, in certain instances um, is more important than your, your race or ethnicity or your social class or, or in some cases even your, you know, your geography where you live. Um, so this is leading me to think, you know, maybe it's time for us to re-examine, you know, does race matter, does ethnicity matter, and if so, how does it matter, when does it matter, and in what ways does it matter, because, and I think that's one of the, the lessons of, of Los Angeles and, and, you know, the sort of the Los Angeles experience, that of course race matters, of course ethnicity matters. But I think the more interesting question is how does it matter and in what situations does it matter? Um, so that's, you know, I think that's the home ownership thing is kind of a hook to get at some of these bigger questions. I think we all realize that we're all multifaceted. The idea that someone would just define you only as African American, only as Latino, and that's your complete and total identity um, goes against our own experience. Yet when we do research and we start talking about politics, we talk about Latino politics as though everybody who's Latino and votes are only, is only going to vote one way or this is the way you attract a, a Latino voter. Yet you can already see with Dr. Marx's comments that there are all kinds of different dimensions. Um, and one of the dimensions is in terms of uh, the youth and, and how you try to uh, uh, attract them. And we discussed this quite a bit in the, in the last uh, uh, panel. But in terms of some of the stuff that you've done, what do you think it would take to attract people like our, in our audience to really be civically engaged and to, and to participate? Well, you know, I think for academics, politicians, the media makes this, you know, mass marketers often make this mistake of sort of looking at groups as being, you know, homogenous. So, you know, what is the Latino reaction to, you know, the protests or what is the, you know, the Latino reaction to the, you know, the House bill? It kind of assumes it lumps, lumps all these people into this category um, when in fact, you know, when you take it, a look at that label, what is Latino? And, you know, that masks an incredible diversity in terms of um, the specific ethnic origins underneath that label. And then I'll be talking about, um, you know, the American-born children of immigrants. Are we talking about um, first-generation people? Are we talking about, you know, people who arrived here as immigrants 30 years ago? Um, so that we've, I, I think in terms of targeting these programs and talking about what would it take to get the youth involved, I think we got to, you know, well, which youth are we talking about? And, you know, I mean, in the same way, I guess, that, you know, the media is now fragmented down to these little um, interest groups, I think, you know, even just talking about the youth is, is probably too big of a, of a group to talk about. Yeah, Melina? Right. Well, I agree with you. We can't um, lump all young people together. And my work deals <laughs> primarily with young people of color and people, of, people from working class communities. And I think that what we need to think about when we talk about youth mobilization um, is really 
kind of building out issues that have some immediacy for young people. But so, do, so, do we know of a case where young people have been mobilized? Yes, actually we can think of two cases. Uh -huh. um, one, right now, if we look out in the streets of Los Angeles right. and what's happening with the immigration protests and the young people walking out of their schools and getting out in the streets, you know, on the 25th and, uh, you know, and grew after, up. Yeah. Right, and after and Saturday, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are, there's a, um, trim, there's, the, the issue is something that impacts young people right now, and they understand that they're connecting with it. I think if we think back a few years to what was happening with the schools and the push for the Prop BB funding um, in inner city schools and really what kind of changed that, um, it was the young people working with organizations like Community Coalition who marched down to the school board and demanded the funding. And so when we talk about issues that are immediate to the realities of young people, young people will become involved. I think they also have to be able to define the issue themselves. And one of the things, one of the reasons why I study hip hop is because one of the things that happened you in my You just like thoughts, to hear the music, I mean. Yeah, uh, you know, it is an excuse. I do like, you know, little, dead I mean, every, every student out here is gonna say, okay, I wanna study hip hop. That's what I'm gonna do my paper on or whatever. So when you say you study hip, I mean, what do you actually do? Well, really what I'm studying is hip hop is a site of kind of potential um, movement building. And what we see with, there's kind of two streams of hip hop, so I'm not talking about the Yin Yang Twins. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The panelists probably don't. No. <laughs> but I'm not talking about the Yin Yang Twins. What I'm talking about yeah, if is- If you're not talking about the twins, who are you talking about? Yeah. I'm talking about what I call real, <laughs> authentic hip hop. So That's groups like Dead Prez, yeah. groups like The Cool, Immortal Technique, these are um, all in my CD right now. I'm in my car. <laughs> <laughs> These are the. I mean, if you really listen to what's being said, even by some more mainstream artists, um, Talib Kweli, you know, some other folks, it's really um, political messaging. And I think what well, hip hop it, it's provides. It's political messaging from their perspective. You think it's being received as political yes. message? How many yes. of you receive it as a political message when you hear this stuff? Or How many just, of you listen to, to what I call authentic hip hop? Okay. And then so, what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Do you just listen to it or do you, does it mobilize you to do something? How, do you, how is that initial interest or that message then mobilize you to act or to think or do? But this is nothing new in terms of popular culture. Popular culture has always impacted us in, in politically, socially, and in other ways. Or is there something new well, about hip-hop? Well, there is something new about hip-hop. And I think what is new is the way that hip-hop, well, hip-hop's not new, I guess, especially for the students. It's been around as long as they've been alive. Um, but hip-hop really um, kind of grew out of protest. And it was kind of a place where um, it, it grew at a time where there were no other outlets. And so it grew as a political movement. Um, and I think that the space that was created through hip hop, if we go to any of these underground shows, we know that it's not just, you know, um, Dead Prez has a show, I think, next month, right? And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and if you go to any of these kinds of shows, it's not just Dead Prez performing, it's also discussion about it. If you think about followers of Immortal Technique, um, it's, it's kind of initiating a conversation. And I think that it is kind of a political awakening for young people who feel like they cannot just be, they don't have to just be receivers of the information, but then can contribute to it. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on some, some of your other research. And the LA Times had a front page story a couple of days ago about African Americans and Latinos in this protest. And the basic thrust of the, the, the um, article was, why, weren't, why wasn't there an outreach to the African American community be, uh, from the organizers. And, you know, my, I mean, my response was, well, there wasn't an outreach to anybody else. Uh, not, not, only, not only were African Americans not outreached to, neither were whites, neither were, frankly, English-speaking, non-immigrant Latinos. It was an immigrant movement. Um, is, is there, I mean, and from my perspective, we've talked about a, you know, white LA, black LA, rich LA, 
um, a homeowner LA, renter LA. There's also immigrant LA and non-immigrant LA. And there are a lot of Latinos who are in non-immigrant LA. But this whole, this, uh, is there a criticism of the movement because they didn't reach out to blacks? I mean, there seems to be that from that article right. and others that I've heard. Do you have, pick up that sense? There is a criticism. I think that, um, I think Mara was doing a good job kind of talking about how, you know, no one community is a monolith. Um, I think among um, particularly younger African Americans, the criticism is, is less apparent. And I know some folks are going to say, well, what about in the high schools? What's going on in the high schools? But I believe that uh, among younger um, African Americans, the criticism is, is less loud. Um, but among older African Americans, you tend to hear the criticism. Um, I heard one, one um, commentary on the radio where a guy was saying, well, they never got involved in our marches in the civil rights era, which is actually wrong. <laughs> but, and then they didn't invite us to theirs. And I think that's starting to but be they remedied. Didn't, they didn't. The immigrant, they didn't invite African Americans. Right, but when do you need an invitation to no, participate? Okay, right. right. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, it is also on the other end, I mean, if we think about what's happening this Saturday, it's a unity march. Mm -hmm. And they are specifically, whoever the organizers are, are saying African Americans, Latinos, Asians. We also need to think about immigrant populations as not just being Latino, right? So there are many Africans who are here. I mean, we have one of the biggest Ethiopian populations right. in Fairfax. the country, right? Um, and I think that you tend to see that um, reality kind of come to light more clearly on the East Coast right. if you think about the marches there. Or in Miami and Haitians. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Ricardo, you, you, you study this, okay, and you're taking a look at immigration. What's the end game here with these marches? Is it just that bill? And, it, and to me, it seems like three options. Number one, the bill gets defeated. Number one, the bill gets passed in some version or another. Or it just, number three, it just gets kind of forestalled and we don't know what we're dealing with. Given those three scenarios, what happens to this movement that, that we see going? Well, I mean, I think we need to take a step back and first go back to the initial question you asked Melina. Uh, no, but a lot of, it wasn't an immigrant versus non-immigrant. It was a, who listens to Spanish language media and who doesn't? Uh, so immigrants were, listen no, to No, 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 that's, but it, there's also a lot of non-immigrants who listened to that and who were aware of that. So, you know, take me for example. I I listened to that particular okay, you know, the initial you're a professor. No, 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 no. I, yeah, I, no, I, but it's, I it, reject it's, that. It's, it's the initial, it, it's sort of the, the comparison to hip hop, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a particular type of music that's listened to. It wasn't all Spanish language media on that first day. That first day, it was three uh, the three initial organizers who went and asked for a little bit of air time, and no one anticipated the end outcome. You know, so when I was listening to it, it was like watching a pledge drive on, on one of the public radio stations, you know. Well, well I we would got, change the channel when there's a pledge yeah, drive. Yeah, exactly. But these pledge drives were a show of authenticity by the grassroots organizations. So the, the main DJ would be like, well, I just heard from the Orange County Soccer League, mm -hmm. and they're going to bring, you know, they, they just told me they're going to bring 10,000 people. I haven't heard from X or Y or Z organization. So then they would call in, and it was just, a, a, you know, I, I had no idea that people were actually going to follow through with, with their pledges. Uh, so that's the first part of it. Your, your other question is actually... So wait, wait, what's the first part of it? Uh, Spanish language... It was Spanish language regardless of nativity, because you also saw a lot of non-immigrants uh, that were out there. People who may have had family yeah. who were immigrants and who were still very much connected through this particular type of music. But I am not convinced that the organizers reached out beyond the immigrant community. They, they went with what they had access to. Which no, I was, agree. Which I'm, was not, the, I'm not yeah. criticizing. I'm just yeah, saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think the fact is that yeah. this was an immigrant movement organized by immigrants for immigrants. No, but the, the initial people that so were, what? Yeah. No, that's my, that's my point. So what? <laughs> Yeah. You know, but no, everybody keeps trying to make it uh, like, oh no, they did reach out, they should have reached out, and, and, the, and the whole point. But I, I don't think that they knew that it was going to get as big as it did. Okay. Yeah, so they, they, I think they thought it was going to be a few thousand people. But are you, are you, are you bothered if it was only an, an immigrant movement for immigrants? 
No, I mean they they did with what resources they had. So I oftentimes feel that there's a there there's a, always an attempt to say though there's coalition building, etc. Oftentimes, for a group to gain power, it has to organize itself and in a sense express that power and then build coalitions. Exactly. Because even even if you look at what's going on with Latinos, you know we we talk about not lumping people together, not lumping all youth, Latino immigrants are there's there can sometimes be some divisions based on country mm -hmm. of origin. And for a lot of the Mexican immigrants, it's by state of origin. Right. So you have the Zacatecanos versus the, you know, people from Jalisco versus whatever. And th this first part, this first phase was bringing the unity within that, the, the immigrant community. The, Sal the Salvadorians, the Mexicans, the Guatemalans, and, and other Latin Americans, and, and even other non-Latino immigrants. Yeah. So that's the first part of it. It's like they did with what resources they had. Your larger question of what, what's going to happen, regardless of what th those three options that right. you suggest, well, we've got to ask where. The, the reality is, contextually, uh, it's not the same to talk about outcomes in California versus other places. We've already seen this movement in 1994 uh, through, through the mid-1990s, and we saw a lot of the outcomes. The outcomes were Latinos got mobilized, especially those who were naturalized. They got mobilized, they voted at a higher, they, they now vote at higher rates than native-born Latinos. They stayed, they stayed uh, more mobilized and, and continued voting. You don't have that. You, you look at a state like Arizona, where they're actually being attacked in the same way that they were, uh, that Latinos in, in California were being attacked in, their, in the early and mid-1990s. So we have to see, like, you know, oh, look at uh, North Carolina. Those are burgeoning Latino communities. You're going to have a completely different outcome based on whatever results you have. In so there will be different levels of analysis. One will be at the federal yeah. level, one will be at the state, and it will play itself out differently in each state. But at the federal level, what, how, do you, how will it play out regarding the specific immigration uh, legislation that's currently being proposed? I think the, the fallout is going to be that people are going to know that there is this medium that can mobilize a certain community, sort of like uh, with African Americans in the Civil Rights Movement, we knew that the churches could come together and mobilize across many cities, many states, and have a unified message. You, now you, you jump forward 30, 40 years, and you have the Spanish language media being used to mobilize people. The fact that you, I mean, across states, across different cities, you had the same exact message of wearing white shirts, bringing in more flags, or, uh, more U.S. flags than other countries. And it was consistent across different cities. That's amazing. You don't have any, almost any other movement that can hold, that can coalesce around a particular image the way you just saw. And, and why is the media, which is really a business, for-profit business, why are they doing this? It gets more listeners. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's like it benefits them to know that they have, uh, that, that their listeners are going to perceive, and, uh, and, and in most instances, correctly so, that they're interested in the well-being of Latinos or uh, those that listen to Spanish language media. So, hey, Ruth, can I get you in on this? Uh, you're you are a council member, and we talked about segmentation. I, I got two very quick questions. One: Did you know about this march before it happened on March 21st? Or 25th, had you heard about it before? I think so, yeah. Okay. But remember, I've been out of politics for three years. No, no, because no, the reason I ask that is because I know quite a few elected officials, and we knew this was happening, and we called them up to ask them to kind of test yeah. whether they knew, and, and they a lot of know. them, they were really caught by surprise. Well, so, can, you know. can I say something about that? Sure, I, that's why I we have think, the mic. Go yes, ahead. thank you. Uh, I actually think that Prop 187, I've even forgotten what year that was. 94. 94. 94. Prop 187 was a huge watershed in ethnic politics in Los Angeles, in, in politics in Los Angeles. And what impressed me so much was that the young Latinos and Latinas that, that I represented, from mostly from the Mar Vista area, were so enraged at what happened that Prop 187 got on the ballot and that people went out and voted for it, and they took it appropriately, very personally. And after that, there was a huge increase in adults signing up for citizenship classes and making the effort that was required to become a citizen so they could vote. And these young people who, who did the same sort of thing then, not the 94 equivalent of this, presumably have done the same thing. And I remember talking to a group of them at Venice High School, and I said, so how many people are registered to vote? And uh, 
one of them looked at me with utter contempt and he said, Ruth, we're not citizens. And of course, and I had forgotten all about that. To me, they were my constituents. Uh, but they, those kids are now grown up and they are the people I feel sure they are among those who showed up on these marches. But what happened with these marches is they scared the living daylights out of the politicians. It is really exciting because what is very, one thing all politicians can do is count. And when they see that there are this many people all over the country taking this issue very seriously, suddenly it becomes, all of a sudden, it's a really important issue. Now, it's been an important issue all along, but it didn't hit the radar screen until there were, it was impossible to not see thousands upon thousands of people including those who could get in trouble if they got caught because they're not here legally. Um, by the way, I have to say I got in trouble with the LA Times many years ago when I worked, uh, I was working for a public health law office funded by the War on Poverty. And this is before you were a council member? Way before I was a council so, member. Yeah. It, was my, it was in the 70s. Um, before you had formal power. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't have any power at all then, but I did have a newsletter, and so I agree with you about the media. Um, one of my colleagues and I wrote an op-ed piece for the LA Times about medical care for uh, what we called undocumented residents. Mm -hmm. And the LA Times at the time insisted upon changing it to, un to illegal aliens, and we had a fight over this. And I found out later that within the editorial board of the LA Times in 1970, whatever it was, they had a fight about the terminology. So I, I want to, I'm excited we have somebody doing linguistics here. And I believe that we finally lost on that. They published, I said, pull the piece, I don't care. I'm not publishing it, but my colleagues said, no, no, it's very important. Since that time, you'll notice that there's, there's an interesting mix now. Sometimes they say undocumented workers. Sometimes it's the aliens thing that really bothers me. And all it means is that they're not citizens, but you know, with space travel and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, it was a day that annoys me no end. So I think that what, what happened with this new series of marches is that uh, politicians, the, the political establishment is going to have a very hard time going back. It happened when I got on the city council in 1987. It's hard to believe now. Nobody ever talked about the environment. Well, when I showed up having had a huge upset victory, suddenly everyone was an environmentalist. They didn't know any more about the issue than they did the day before, but they could all count. And that's what's going to happen now, except this is more complicated. This time there's not universal agreement. So there is, uh, seems to me, an enormous potential to shape the issue because of the activity that's happened. Because they're all waiting for somebody to frame the issue in a way that will allow them to satisfy a broad enough cross-section of their constituents to get reelected. Well, that's what I want to talk to Otto about, framing the issue. But before that, i got two quick questions for you, Ruth. Uh, One is, uh, well, first of all, a comment. It seems your comments and Ricardo's comments regarding on how to mobilize Latinos is that you have to scare them. And that's probably the case with any group, that you're more successful at mobilizing if you scare people instead of giving them hope. Well, now, I have another theory about that. I think that works, but I also think it's the case that people, people move either when they're scared or when they feel comfortable moving forward. I disagree with that latter half. No, I mean, you know Speaking I do some stuff with uh, Naleo that tries to mobilize well, tell people. Tell what Naleo uh, is. The National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and uh, they actually are one of the few organizations that actually targets uh, Latinos in a nonpartisan way, but specifically also focuses on youth. They work really, really hard to up the, the the levels of participation just a little bit because it's really hard with positive messages to get people out to vote. You know, Prop 187 so then, has done so then the much politicians more. have been right in terms of you negative ads work, you scare people, they will come out more likely than if you're positive. Yeah. That negative ads don't necessarily deflate the overall politics. It's more about being a rational voter. Yeah. If people know that if something there's negative repercussions and you explain that to them, if you don't become a citizen or if you don't become registered to vote, no one's gonna uh, or vote on your behalf, pay attention to you. Whereas if you tell them if you vote, you get to be a good citizen. Yeah. 
you know, that's not a very good sell. You know, you get to, you know, add one more vote to the several million other votes. So, uh, Ruth, uh, earlier Dr. Marx was talking about segmentation and elected officials, when they're candidates, like you were a candidate several times, you purposely segment and you know how to go after certain voters and you go after them with one message about them being homeowners, et cetera. And so it's something that you do and you did very well and effectively, that's how come you got elected. So segmenting and really putting people as unidimensional and the better you can do that, the more effective you are. Yeah, but the, in, in order to do that effectively, you have to know what they really think. And one of the things that impressed me when I, when I very first ran in 87, the district was about two-thirds Anglo and about one-third African-American. And when I started to campaign in the African-American part of the district, all my advisors, including, by the way, my African-American campaign manager, said to me, now look, Ruth, when you get over there, shut up about all this environmental stuff. Because, and I said, why? And they said, well, because people over there are much more interested in jobs. They're not interested in that. And I said, come on, everybody's interested in what they're breathing. So I went over to campaign, and the first person I met, I was helping plant trees, and he said to me, I'm going to support you. He was African-American, an adult man. And he said, I'm going to support you. Would you like to know why? I said, well, yeah, actually I would. And he said, because you're an environmentalist, and we need an environmentalist. So from this I learned that the, the um, stereotype of how you target voters is frequently wrong. Were well, you running against an African-American? Uh, no. no. But I was running against an incumbent who had been supported by the African-American community for 18 years. So just a real generalization. Do you think you would have been supportive of you had there been an African-American, a viable African-American? Actually, I think that person would have been. But uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, there were certainly many people in that part of the district who did not vote for me because they didn't know me and they did know my opponent, even though she was white. The following term, I was running against an African-American woman. Um, and uh, there were a number of shady things that happened where a Democratic slate operator, somebody who puts out a slate for Democrats, um, put her on the slate turns out she was a Republican. And I actually beat her by, as soon as the, we, I found out I was in a runoff by 35 votes, um, I, we, we won the election a week later by simply publishing her voter registration card. And the, the African American community was furious because they all vote Democratic and they were very upset that she was a Republican and trying to sell herself to them as a Democrat. And the Republicans in the district were furious because they thought she should be proud to be a Republican. And their targeted mailing was very helpful. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the people who were voting for her were, I think many of them were planning to vote for her because she was an African American and they knew her. So you were, an, you were a council member for 16 years. What's the number one thing you regret the most that you didn't do during that time when you had power? I'm very proud of what I did. I can't think I can tell you the No, usually people ask me that question the other way around. No, let, me, I, let me say, no, let me say that. that okay, three, what were you the proudest of? No. See if I ask you what the proudest no, no, of you. No, no, no. What I want to so. tell you, what I want to tell you, because I think this is the one of the issues to, for people who have not yet run for office to think about, is that when I ran for office and when I was elected, I had no idea how much you could accomplish if you really work at it. You don't just make speeches about it, you actually work at it. And looking back at it, now that I've been out for three years, it still amazes me how much you can accomplish. And you can do it, and you do it partly by following through on whatever you said, working with the bureaucrats, but you do a lot of it by helping people in the community who have something they want to do do it. So in my last year, when I represented a district out in the Northeast Valley that was 71% Latino, a group of young people, most of them were in the community in Mission College and some were out of college and had their own jobs and businesses, uh, came to me very anxious to protect the immigrant culture that they felt was being um, lost as their parents tried to assimilate. And they wanted to put on a festival 
They wanted me to put on a festival. I said, what are you kidding? A white woman from the West Side putting on a festival about Latino culture? You put it on. And they looked at me and so I said, I'll get you the money and I'll help you, but you have to do it. And they did it and it was fabulous. And I hope, then I had to leave because of term limits, but I hope that those people who really learned a lot of skills and got to know everybody in the community are going to stay involved. But so I don't you, know. You mean to tell me that there's nothing that you accomplished everything you wanted, number one? I, I did accomplish okay. everything I went there to do. Is there anything you, you've ever bit your tongue on when you were a council member that now that you're not on the council, you're free to say? And go ahead and say it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm going to go back and answer your first question. What I regret is that I wasn't able to create more affordable housing than I was able to create. Um, what, what I, but isn't that are, are we private, allowed, are we private a, sector? Well, but you can, it's amazing what you can do when they want something from the city. Uh -huh. And actually there is a, some affordable housing on the west side that exists because the developers want, needed special permits from the city and I was the person who had to sign off on them. So there's, there is more power and more um, maneuverability than I would have known going in. Um, you were going to ask me if you could do something. I was going to ask you if I could yes. say a bad word. Uh, they're, they're Jesuits, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to tell you that the very hardest thing about being an elected official, and, and sometimes I'm sorry that I behaved myself as well as I did, the really hardest thing is that there are a great many people out there who are your constituents who, are, who are, behave not very nicely. They may be nice people, although some of them are just greedy and selfish, but um, no matter who they are and no matter how wrong they are, when you are an elected official, you are absolutely never allowed to call an asshole an asshole. Mm -hmm. And that is the hardest piece of self-discipline there is because when you're a critic, when you're on the outside, when you're marching, you can call anybody anything that you feel is appropriate. But when you are in a position, the trade-off for having the power to accomplish things so, is that sometimes you really have to behave yourself. So is there a rule book for elected officials and it says don't call an asshole an asshole and it's got all these other different rules? Um, it used to be that the rule book was, was um, like folklore. It was passed along in an oral tradition. I don't know how term limits has really affected that. Yeah. Dr. Santana, we were talking about uh, framing the, uh, what's been happening in the last couple of weeks, um, and also kind of what Ruth is talking about, framing just politics in general and, and the language that we use and how important it is. And I know we're going to have a little bit of a presentation up here to talk, talk about this. So All right. uh, please proceed. If um, The trouble is that I don't have the monitor in front of me, so I can't. But he can, um, he can uh, flip it for you. Right, but yeah. I can't see it. So would you mind if I you could yeah, actually go stand up? Yeah. Stand up. Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who are in front, I have a handout for all of you. Uh, yeah, my framework of analysis is uh, cognitive science. So basically what I do is I look at tons and tons of, of uh, press material, basically articles from the Los Angeles Times. So you can go ahead and flip ahead. And basically I say that I, what I focus on is just the metaphor. So if you, so I will skip all the theory and please go ahead, Sal. Oh, one more. That's why we had Ruth here to skip all the theory, but you can go okay, ahead and now, do it too. Well, <laughs> basically, what what uh, uh, Ruth was saying, and which I want to concur with, is in the, uh, the LA Times and all the rest of the media in the '90s had only one representation of immigrants, one one way of talking about immigrants. Flip the switch. Next slide. And so, go ahead and move forward. The basic idea that I did when I did a systematic study, <coughs> comprehensive, for two, and a half, uh, two years of LA Times material was this was the major concept, immigrants or animals. And there was 87 uh, uh, instances and 101 articles. Okay, next. so what, what, what sp specifically explain that. Exactly, the next, so immigrants were characterized in many different ways. You can see these are all quotes from the Los Angeles Times. I just put some italics so you can see. Immigrants, they herded us together like goats. Next, they're animals that were drawn into a trap. The lure is jobs. For those of you, you can see it, it is on, uh, it's right there. Governor uh, Pete Wilson said he believed that public benefits are the lure. So 
immigrants were considered lured in as if they were animals, if they didn't have any uh, rational sense. Next, immigrants were considered those people, well, they were considered animals who could be hunted. And so here's a quote, beaten down agents given only enough quarry to catch a third of their, uh, given enough resources to catch a third of their quarry, <laughs> meaning animals. Or this next quote, uh, agents must quit the chase, the chase of immigrants, as if you were ch uh, chasing down a deer. Next, Im animals were, immigrants were considered animals to be eaten. So here's another quote, employers hungering for really cheap land or hunt out. So all of these, and go on, please. So at times, we're specific animals, go on. And so most often, we're pack animals. Next. This was basically the formula. It's very grim. Citizens are to immigrants as, next, humans are to animals. So basically, what we did is we set up the discourse that's used, the conservative discourse that's used today by conservatives con constitute a contrast between immigrants and citizens. Since citizens are people, and immigrants are not citizens, a false piece of logic walks in. And that basically is that they're less than people. Next. So this becomes a very, very ugly scenario. And it's subtle. It's not blatant, but it's racist all the, all the way. So when we were systematically at Los Angeles Times, for, uh, this is what we received. Go on, please. The trouble is all the immigrant metaphors were negative. And, all, and Latinos were, in, were obviously immigrants, irrespective of the fact that they might have been here for five generations. Next. Uh, you can click, 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 click. Sound effects. Oh. <laughs> Two more. One more. One more. Thank you. These are some of the examples of the other immigrant metaphors, all of which were negative. Next, Sal, please. The, this is the most grim part. It turned out that immigrants, advocates for immigrants, for example, uh, the UFW and pro-187 people shared the same metaphors. Basically, the immigrant advocates said, we're not animals, we're not criminals. They kept repeating the same discourse. Moreover, the Los Angeles, I compared, I thought, well, you compare LA Times with La Opinion, same thing. What effectively it was during the 90s was that we had only one way of conceptualizing publicly, immigrants. So there was no, and so people knew when 187 was promoted, that it was going to pass. There was no question. And 400,000 people in the streets would not make a difference. Next. Now we have, you know the law of un, uh, uh, unintended consequences. Well, in, we are in a different circumstance. Another, another century and a new situation. Next, please. George Bush, of all people, uh, in, on, January se on January 4th or 7th of 2004, I was driving on the 101. I was going to work, and I heard this announcement and this discussion, and it was George Bush. I thought it was a parody. I thought it was a joke. Right? They were just driving along, and I had the wrong channel on, and, uh, and I thought, well, it was a joke. And it turned out, I realized it was not. It was George Bush talking. And he was talking affirmatively about Latinos and immigrants. So much so I had to get off the 101 because I was afraid I was going to wreck. It was so astonishing to me. <laughs> it was a 20-minute speech. It was apparently aimed at um, attracting Latino voters, but what it did is it legitimized another discourse. Next, Sal. And this is his, his discourse. All these are quotes from his statement, and we're seeing this now repeated in the press today, that instead of being animals or criminals, there's an alternative way of looking at immigrants as hardworking men and women, energetic, ambitious, um, optimistic people. Next, that we're, uh, immigrants have families. They don't drop their young, they actually have children. And they have talent, character, and patriotism. They take hard jobs and clock in long hours. Next, and we have values, faith in God, love of family, everything that everybody knows, but that it wasn't repeated in the public, in the media. 
Next. And then he, was a, he even explained a little bit of history. Next. And talked about assimilation. Next. And told us that the, United, the President of the United States told us that America is a welcoming society for the entrepreneurial spirit of immigrants and it's wise to do so. Next. And that we, we ha value immigration, depend on immigration, and we need a system that serves the economy and reflects the American dream. Next. So this is an incredible change. In 94, no possibility of any discourse except the one dehumanizing discourse. Next. Now we have two competing discourses. That's why I also believe that the 500,000 to 1.3 million people that you see on the streets, that you saw on the streets in, on the 25th of March, there's a discourse that, the, that we can hear that reflecting two perspectives. In the past, it wasn't that case. Thank you. So you can just cut it. <laughs> so that, that's, that, uh, I didn't anticipate having, uh, but that's it. So that, that's, what I, that's a short, a long, a long answer to a short question. So, so po language is powerful, we know that. And half of the, half of, uh, halfway to victory is just being able to define the terms and being able to define how one speaks a, a, of something. And, but this is not anything new. Historically, immigrants, whether they were Latino or Europeans, meaning you know Italians, Irish, Slovaks, etc., were always defined in, in a certain way that led to us to think of them as "quote unquote" animals. It's not only immigrants, but you know even once they were here, the Chinese and African Americans for sure. Absolutely. And then in terms of every time we've been in a in a war, how we define the enemy, it's always you have to portray them and try to make them be uh, less than human so that you can then have 18 year olds go out and kill them that you're sending them over there so it's always about language and defining it and, and preparing when, when you talk about the changing discourse it's bush did this before the the marches happened oh yes what what, what would you explain about uh, why does george bush do this oh well i mean consider him a conservative democrat excuse me a conservative republican <laughs> um well, I def he's definitely a Republican, and, but, but what was important was that what he did is he, as a president, uh, at the beginning of his uh, campaign for uh, re-election, he was trying to, to uh, bring and attract Latino conservative voters to his, to his fold, and he was effective. And he spoke in the language that Latinos always talk about our families and communities. Yeah, but this statement that now, you're reading but, is but, after but, his re-election. But, but, but in 2004, right after that, this, this, his proposal was completely shot down. And one of the consequences was that very anti, there's a, there's a movement of conservative Republicans who consider him to be um, uh, having betrayed uh, and opened up the society to destruction because there's a very strong nativist per, uh, perspective that is, that is propelled. And so in 2005, the Minutemen, who were very effective at galvanizing uh, a viewpoint, used Bush and his policy as being the example of failed politicians. And so, it, uh, but what he had done, they were so angry at him because he was the president he legitimized a discourse that otherwise would never have been able to be utilized. And we're not, right now, you know, right now, it's currently, uh, I have students currently studying the discourse in the Los Angeles Times and elsewhere to see if these two discourses are competing. But just by the quick reads, we can see that the, the language is, is uh, the two different courses are in competition. I think that bodes well for our society. In the past, this, this issue was not, was um, uh, a losing proposition. And now it really isn't. Uh, when it comes to someone this was talking about the poll today, the LA Times poll, that it was Republicans, didn't you? What was that uh, that you said in the previous uh, about? Uh, that it seemed like Republicans were even more in favor of a balanced approach, at least from, from among the voters. Than, than the Democrats. And part of that obviously had to do with the economic situation 
where they said a lot of those Republicans were more educated, well-to-do, and, and a lot of the Democrats who were not as enthused about a balanced approach and favored more, um, uh, I guess, enforcement had the lower end jobs. So it comes into an economic. So we see really there is a, uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not a political scientist, but I see the basics of, of politics that if there is no, if we don't vote, if there's no, if, if we know we're not going to win and it's, there's no real battle. So that's, but now we have two, a real contest of ways of conceptualizing immigrants. Uh, undocumented immigrants is the one perspective or illegal immigrants, and that discourse allows people to galvanize their attentions and focus, and I think, uh, I believe in the democratic process, and we're going to arrive at something more equitable. But I think you have to add to that analysis the fact that um, people who are interested in politics and, and voting as a way of achieving goals now see the support for immigrants constituency as a constituency, yes. and that's what was missing before. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, there's an incentive if you're trying to either run for office or capture the House or the Senate or a state legislature, there's a new level of incentive to pay attention to this issue and to develop a more humane and realistic approach than in the past simply because we now know there, look at them, there are hundreds of thousands of them out there, yeah, but, and some of them are going to vote. Well, the, and that's part of the message that they're all across the country, they were saying, here today, then tomorrow's voters, you know. Mm -hmm. So they're making it yeah, really but, easy for politicians. But a candidate who's running tomorrow, I mean, literally tomorrow, is not going to care about a year or two from now. I mean, let me, let me go back to the, and I'm going to get Michael involved here, but let me go back to 1994. 187 happened and, and was put on the ballot, and Pete Wilson endorsed it and went full force for it. Remember, Pete Wilson was actually a moderate Republican. And he was way behind in the polls to Kathleen Brown at the time. And he used it as a way to get himself catapulted and win a second term. So there was no consequence to him doing it. As, as a matter of fact, it was the opposite. Okay? So right now in the short run, over the next two to six years, um, if you want to get elected, I think you could still be anti-immigrant because most of those people who are out in the uh, streets of LA, Phoenix, and Dallas, they're not going to vote for another four to six years. That's a, that's a prediction. We will see whether that actually occurs. I would have had to agree with you completely in 1994, 96, or 98, which was the case. But now, in the public discourse, there is a real debate going on. And there is a, a way of conceptualizing immigrants and immigrant rights in, that did not did, did not breach the mainstream media. So that uh, so there's a so people were who did not know who immigrants were, who did not have uh, friends who were Latino, who only saw the valet mm -hmm. and only had maybe a nanny. Those people were afraid. Now they can see uh, a human face so and a human you? language referring to them. So it's kind of an analogy for the students, and I'm not sure it's a perfect analogy, it's just the same way that in terms of the civil rights movement made it illegitimate to talk about African Americans in certain ways and therefore changed the discourse that you couldn't scapegoat African Americans for election purposes because not that you weren't going to get African American votes, but that you weren't going to get moderate white votes, mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans alike, mm -hmm. that they, these, these white voters, because of the discourse and its changing, we're now going to vote against you if you continue to scapegoat African Americans. But so let's not forget that we lost the South as a result of the civil rights movement. I mean, my, my fear about all this when is that... When you say we lost the South... The Democrats, you, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, you know... I, mean, I don't know whether you were talking about the Civil War or, you know... <laughs> I, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's... You know, I mean, I guess my concern here, and I want to, you know, let my colleague here get a chance here, but... My, my fear is that in the same way that um, we were, you know, some of us were kind of excited that, you know, gay rights was finally on the agenda and that people, you know, it, we thought it became unfashionable to talk, you know, in, in a condescending way about gay people. That was used as a wedge in the last election. I mean, you know, I thought that the issue of our time had something to do with terrorism, but it turned out I was really stupid. It turned out that the critical issue of my generation is whether or not the sanctity of marriage should be 
between a man and a woman. So in the same way, my fear is that, you know, the Lou Dobbs listeners, viewers, you know, will mobilize even more. Well, you they know? were never going to vote for a Democrat anyway, one can say. Well, so. no, but it might, I mean, we, so. this could, this, we don't know how this is going to play out, I guess is my point. Okay, so. To the extent that the, the working class white male is still the voter to capture, to make a difference, the swing voter that the Democrats go after on economic issues, the Republicans go after on cultural issues, it, it's still going to be very useful to use immigration as a wage issue, I think, for uh, quite some time to come. And certainly with the case with 187, we didn't see, we saw the short-term benefits for Republicans, but there was a, a longer term uh, with the mobilization and registration uh, of Latinos in the Democratic camp that's making things harder for Republicans now in California. But we still have a Republican governor, and it, I'm not so sure that the effect is, is going to be uh, that long term, because we also have more Latinos re registering as Republicans now. Uh, in terms of discourse legitimate, legitimation, I think clearly there is there is a legitimation that's occurred that has you know now you're you're able to you know argue you're what your legitimate group and so we're going to welcome you in the mix and I think that discourse has changed and it's been immensely consequential but it's a different question than than one of empowerment and I think that the question of empowerment is still the, the gravest threat that uh, the immigrants and non-citizens have because not only uh, of institutional barriers, which I'm assuming we talked about a little bit this morning, but that while immigrants may no longer be as invisible as a, of a group as they were a few weeks ago, um, they are still an alienated group and an insulated group and an isolated group. And unless there are institutional means or, or means of institutionalizing that mobilization, my sense is that it is going to remain uh, something that we see every once in a while with 187 or with you know, when an, a very threatening immigration bill starts coming down from the federal government and that the, the shape of politics to come is going to be more episodic, more fugitive, that you will get occasional uh, but temporary mobilization efforts. And until <coughs> there is a, an ins a means of institutionalizing that resistance and a means of maintaining that resistance, it's not going to have... Uh, the effect that it did in the past, with past immigrants. In the past, uh, particularly in terms of urban democracy, I think that the dilemma is, is a lack of institutionalization. There's not the sort of public employee jobs that immigrants could capture. So what you're saying in the past, you're talking about the Irish, the Italians, right. Jews, and it was easily, easy to incorporate them into urban America because of the political party, but also patronage jobs and all that. I think it was and, easy and for because, them to get power. Right, and they could become citizens right away without going through what uh, contemporary immigrants have to become, uh, or have to go through, excuse me. And so you don't see the same model emerging. In terms of the inco political incorporation of immigrants, the same model is not going to happen. Did they have marches like uh, we saw in Los Angeles and Dallas, et cetera, back uh, when the Irish or the Italians, uh, maybe that was the beginning of St. Patrick's Day, the, a march or something of that <laughs> nature, which, by the way, Lou Dobbs wants to outlaw as well. Uh, uh, Explain to them what the DREAM Act So is. the DREAM Act was uh, basically focusing on immigrants who have been in the U.S. who, not by their choice, maybe they, their parents came over and obviously they were children, so they came with them and as it stood, they had, e even if they were to have lived in California all, since they were five years old, come college time, if they wanted to go to college in, in, in California, they would have to pay out-of-state tuition, which then, you know, the, the price is then astronomical. What the DREAM Act is doing is, if they've uh, gone through high, at least two years of high school in the state where they're living, then they could pay in-state tuition. And furthermore, if they, I think there's a few other criteria, but then it allows uh, an avenue for citizenship. Mm -hmm. So some of the institutionalization and, and maybe patronage, I guess, uh, would be, you know, you, you, vote, or you vote for the party or the members that voted for the DREAM Act because they're the ones that got you uh, the ability to become a citizen. Okay, so, uh, I mean, you study this stuff. You study California politics, you study immigrant, uh, and as soon as I'm done with this question, I want you to pass the mic to Ruth, because I have a question for her, but fast forward five years from now, how will, not national politics, but California politics be different? There's already a Latino mayor. There's already the likelihood of a Latino governor in 
one, two, or three elections from now. Um, you know, there are Latino elected officials coming out of our ears. I mean, we had a bunch of them come through this, these classes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what difference would it make if we had a couple more Latino elected officials? What difference do Latino elected officials make? At the local, state, or federal level? Take your pick. Well, I mean, I think it, it like, let's say, for instance, in the state assembly. So in California, the state assembly and state senate, it's, it's not just that they're an increasing percent of the overall legislature, right? It's that they're an increasing percent of the winning majority. Okay. So Democrats are in power, and Latinos are an increasing per percent of that winning majority. And what difference do they make? So then they can help, I guess, either keep certain policies from even ever getting to the agenda, or encourage others to make it through. So the, the greater percent, as long as they're voting as a cohesive, I mean, this is all assuming that there's a overarching general interest among a lot of these Latino elected officials. And is there? Right. There has been, I think, a more cohesive in the past. I think it's going to get more dispersed in terms of as there's going to be as a, there's more numbers. As saying. there's more numbers, then they, they don't have to coalesce in order to get some of their policies passed. So they're going to bridge coalitions with other racial or ethnic minorities, other non-minorities, it all it's going to come down to whatever they can deliver for their uh, constituents. So they're, so they're gonna just going to become one of the regular... So they're going to behave no differently than Ruth Galanter. Depends. Everybody I mean, they, behaves yeah, differently yeah. than Ruth Galanter. <laughs> it, it's going to depend very much on, you know, so like let's say they're going to need, uh, if, if they coalesce around a particular... Uh, I guess faction. So do Latino leaders make a difference? Yes or no? I think they have, but they ha they've had to change the message. Not this is what the policies we want for Latinos, but they're looking at the future, right? So they're looking at if we advocate for something that impacts all Californians, mm -hmm. in the end, it's going to impact Latinos more. Okay. Can I interject so, something? Because I, I want actually to get Ruth to re to react to it. One thing that I think has been buried a little bit, and that I'm just completely amazed by, is. Uh, our Latino mayor's role in brokering this um, issue about unionization of the security guards. I mean, this is the the attempt to unionize security guards in Los Angeles, and I guess nationwide, is the biggest effort to unionize black workers right now, because security guards are predominantly African Americans. So here you have the Service Employees International Union, which is essentially a union of Latinos, largely immigrant, okay, um, trying to organize largely African African American workforce, and you have a Latino mayor who's been instrumental in brokering this deal. I mean, do Latino mayors make a difference? I mean, here this is Latino mayor is making a difference for African American. But is he, do, is he doing this because, I mean, he came from the labor movement. Is he doing it because he's Latino or because he's well, a coalition builder? Look, he's, he's... we have multiple identities. And I, I kind of want, you know, a Politico to tell me, what does this mean? Come on, Ruth, we're waiting for your answer. I, I'm waiting for you to finish. <laughs> One of the things, now that I'm not a politician, I don't get to interrupt either. Um, I, I actually have a slightly different take on this that I, I don't want to let slide here. I think that um, the role of Latino politicians is now entering a second stage, at least a second stage. For a while, there it was just remarkable that Latinos got elected. We're past that stage now. Latinos get elected all the time for all different kinds of offices. Yeah, one replaced you. Well, that's because I was moved into a district that was designed I for Latinos. I, I made a the, the, quantitative uh, fact. Uh, one, one well, the, but in fact, the district was moved there for the purpose of creating a Latino seat. So what I wanted to point out, that's a very good segue for it, is that I think the issue now is, are they good, good Latino, are they good politicians, are they good for the people, or are they not good for the people, regardless of their Latino-ness? Um, this is also true with respect to women. I, both, my, both of the times I had serious opposition that my opponents were women. Well, what that means is that women have a choice. You don't have to vote for the person um, based on the fact on gender alone. You can actually look at the person's politics and effectiveness. And I, well, I, there are two elements of that that I think are important in the evolution of Latinos' role in California politics. First of all, the, Lat the Latinas had a hard time cracking the Latinos network to start with. 
Um, there has been some remarkable success, and there are some perfectly wonderful people in the state legislature who happen to be both Latina and female. And the but the yeah, Latinas usually are female. Yes, they are. But I'm not sure if you're allowed to say both Latino oh. and female. That doesn't seem right either. Um, you're, you're looking at a race in the San Fernando Valley now for the state assembly between Cindy Montañez, who's been in the state assembly, and Alice Padilla, who's been in the city council. And the boys all went with, with Alex, and some of the women did as well, but not the Latinas. The, um, but there's a chance to choose between two established Latino politicians. Um, so I think that we're now at a stage where you can look at their actual work, not just what they look like. And the other question is, are people willing to vote for somebody who is good for their interests but doesn't look like them? And we don't, I mean, historically, typically, no. If given the choice between a Latino candidate and a white candidate, uh, you're going to assume most people, most of the Latino voters will assume it is better for Latino interests to have the Latino person win. And that may or may not be the case. And as a, a living dinosaur, a white woman politician, I find that a little disheartening because there are a lot of social issues that I care about and I would love to have stayed in a position to do something about them. So just a, a couple, I mean, the students know because many of them were involved last year when we did the exit poll, especially in the primary election for the mayor's office, and our results were the following. A majority of Latinos voted for the Latino candidate, right. a majority of African Americans voted for the African American candidate, and a majority of whites voted for the white candidate. So it, it's pretty clear that people well, will vote. I think that's a real problem because I think that there are, it is, it is often not the case that the person who looks like you is That's necessarily correct. going to have the best politics and be the most effective. But just let me return to Mara's question. Um, I think that's a demonstration of this new stage of evolution. We happen to have a Latino mayor who is interested in those particular issues. Um, it, it could easily be the case that we would have a Latino mayor or an African American mayor or an Anglo mayor or an Asian mayor who wasn't interested. In but I think thing. it was even the same edition of the LA Times. You know, on one in one section of the paper, it was sort yeah. of decrying the fact that you know African Americans have not gotten involved in the immigrant rights movement, and on the other hand, in the same paper, you have this sort of cr cross-ethnic wonderful thing happening, you know, that this, uh, this you know, Latino mayor is championing something, something to help, you know, working class African Americans. But, but part of the problem that, um, you know, we've been talking mostly about what happens with the Latino population and not so much about the African American population, there is a demographic shift here that if Fernando's poll is correct and people only vote for people who look like them, um, African no, my poll is correct. <laughs> no, it was, it was right it's on the It's a student's poll. poll. It was yes, a student's if poll. The, if the poll's results are an accurate reflection, no, they were perfectly people accurate. lie to pollsters all <laughs> no, the time. No, you know a, that. It was, it was an exit poll, and the results were exactly what okay. the election results okay. were. So there given is, that. If they lie, they lie yes. the other way. They, they don't want to. Admit yeah, no. but given that, um, given right. that the poll was correct, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now I forgot what I was going to say. The, the uh, African Americans are a shrinking percentage of the population in the city, and I believe in the state. Mm -hmm. So, if African Americans are not going to feel comfortable with any other elected official than an African American, there is soon going to be a very different kind of problem. Um, let me give you an example from the city of Los Angeles um, reapportionment or apportionment. Every 10 years you have to draw the lines in such a way that all 15 council districts have approximately the same number of people in them. And the Voting Rights Act, federal law, requires that all sorts of other factors be taken into account. The most important one of which is that you can't draw the lines in a way that discriminates against any particular voting group. I'm sure a lot of you know that. So one of the reasons I wound up in the Northeast San Fernando Valley is we used to have 
three West Side representatives, and all of them were Anglo, and all of them, for a while, all of them were Jewish, and um, represented essentially an affluent white population. As the population changed, the demographics changed, the West Side is a smaller percentage of the total city than it used to be, and so it no longer merits three districts. So one of the districts had to move to where the population is to equalize everything out. And that was mine because I was going to be leaving anyway because of term limits, and it went where the population is, which is in the northeast San Fernando Valley, where in fact most of the population is Latino. So. What's going to happen? We still have three districts that are designated the black districts. We don't have enough black population in the city any longer numerically to justify three districts that are designed primarily for African American uh, council members to be elected. This is, a, this is a bad situation to be in if you are part of the African American population and you're not comfortable that any other politician than an African American is going to look out for you. So I, I mean, this is all a tough spot. And a truly small d, democratically inclined mayor would, it seems to me, appropriately go out of his way to demonstrate in that kind of a situation that you don't have to be an African American politician to care about African Americans. So I got all kinds of more questions for you, but I want to get Melina on this, and I got a couple of questions for you as well, but go ahead and respond okay. first. Um, I think, one, we need to um, be clear that I don't believe that African American voters, and this is demonstrated in your poll, um, will only vote for African Americans. No, I, I mean, if we think about um, your, what your poll results say, that the majority of African Americans in the runoff actually did Voted vote for, for Villaraigosa. And, um, well, lots of them voted for me, too, earlier right. on. Right. So it, it, I think it's, it's kind of wrong to say that African-American voters will only vote for people who look like them. I think one of the ways that no, the issue... All, th all things being equal. A black will vote for a black over anybody else. Oh, yeah, else. look at what happened. Well, then there was no black right. mayor. Right. Not necessarily all things being equal, though. In a racially charged environment, right. people yeah. will vote race. So that's, I think that's the great difference. Right, but I think, we'll that, we'll I think that that's, that's right. a key, though, all things being equal. I think that what we see right now is um, this desire to frame um, things in terms of competition between African Americans and Latinos, and in actuality, what's happening right. okay, is African Americans. Why is it framed that way? And we'll, and we'll get to Otto as well. well. I, I, why is it framed that way? I have my way? own view. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I really think it's kind of to divide the folks who need to coalesce the most, and I think it's by design. Okay, um, but this, uh, so that would assume that it would only happen to people that aren't completely informed and you can divide them. Let me give you another example right now. Well, let me, okay, let me pick ahead. up on that first. Um, I think that what we see instead of the competition um, happening more often <laughs> and kind of happening um, especially under this mayoralty is, is um, African Americans becoming much more sophisticated voters and looking at the substance of who these candidates are. Um, so African Americans being able to distinguish between African American candidates. So if you think about the 10th council district race and African Americans saying we want the more progressive candidate, I mean the, the, the one that happened initially, the regular one, let low over, uh, who was it, Duran? Duran, well, yes. uh, or Nate Holden the second, right. right? So being able to distinguish that, right? Um, also, African Americans realizing that their interests aligned with Villaraigosa's commitments. And I think that's the reason that you saw, and there's, there was a really big divide in terms of generation as well, mm -hmm. that younger African American voters are able to, to kind of um, discern the difference more, more readily. Um, I wanted to pick up on the empowerment piece um, and then whatever you want to say. For, um, the empowerment piece, um, when you brought up this question of empowerment, I think what this entire conversation is kind of bringing to light is when we talk about empowerment, we tend to talk about it um, under the framework of political incorporation. And I think that's only one piece of the puzzle. And what we're starting to see now is political incorporation um, is not really an end, it's a means. Mm -hmm. And I think for empowerment for any community, especially oppressed communities, to, to really take place, 
we have to have a combination of both political incorporation and then kind of this outside movement building. And otherwise, it doesn't matter who you elect to office. If they're Latino, African American, right. white, um, they're going to ultimately sell out. <laughs> they don't have someone to keep them kind of in check or a group to keep them in check. Okay. Hey, speaking of empowerment, when do we get to hear from our students? Yeah. <laughs> they don't have a vote. No. <laughs> We're going to get to questions right now, but I got one more question for Ruth and for Melina. Okay. This whole empowerment thing about coalition, right now, the LA City Council, there's 15 members, so eight is a majority. Five Latinos, three African Americans. They have the majority. If those eight got together, this coalition, you know, and they're smart people, so they can't necessarily be manipulated. Yet, I don't see those eight voting uh, as a block. And so this whole idea that they have the same interests, even at the elite level, where they can communicate and talk, they don't seem to be uh, expressing that. Well, I don't want to. And your question is? Look, why aren't those eight minorities voting as a block to direct more benefits to the minority communities of LA? We need to think about who those eight are. And I mean, I don't want to be overly critical, but I, okay. I do uh -huh. feel like, I mean, think about, if we think about authentic representation, why did um, the only council member who, who represents, I think it's still a majority African American district, get elected, Bernard Parks? You know, it was really kind of a, to pay Han back, right? But Bernard Parks. So what's Parks, the definition of authentic? Authentic, but to me, in electoral politics, is the most vote. I'm the most right. authentic representative when I get the most votes. Well, it depends on exactly how you yeah. de define authentic. If you take kind of Lonnie Grenier's definition, are they or? really representing their constituency? And I think what you see happening now, I mean, in Lamert Park, this huge, you know, protest mm -hmm. against Bernard Parks kind of indicates that they realize that he is not an authentic leader of the African American community. I mean, he similarly. He's pretty good, though, man. He's tall, handsome. Yeah. Uh, we had him here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he's charming, all of that. He used to carry a gun. Right. Yeah. I mean, and so that's kind of, I think, what we're seeing is that you don't have folks who kind of have the same interest no. um, or interest in representing their community. Ruth, I got three questions for you, but that's the first one. Why don't those eight get together? Well, I, I think what you have to recognize, first of all, is that the council members rarely get together in any combinations. The, um, this is a very curious. Um, it's, it's different from a lot of the smaller cities around here where you do get voting blocks. But um, particularly since term limits took over, and there's a, remember, there's a whole new crop now. I've, I overlap with only a couple of them. Um, the issues usually don't line up. Um, the issues don't line up in a way that lend themselves to block voting. So you, you find very few eight to seven votes on the city council. Everybody is for improving the schools. Everybody is for having more affordable housing until you propose it next to somebody from their district who says not here, and then they suddenly discover it should be somewhere else. Everyone is for taking care of the homeless problem, so they all vote. What do they vote to do? They vote to create a committee. And, and they're looking into it. And this is somehow, so it's easy for people to not um, line up into blocks. There's, there's no real reason mm -hmm. to be in blocks. Um, I have to tell you, this is a story out of my first term. There I was, a brand new council member. Now, this is a serious one. The, um, I believe this was after the riots, after the Rodney King verdict. Um, and the cops were all acquit acquitted, and then we had this huge blow up in the city of Los Angeles. Some of the African-American police officers went to my field deputy, who was African-American, um, and they said, did you know that at the police substation at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall, in the middle of the black community, there are officers driving around with stickers on their car that are the symbol of South Africa, white South Africa. This is still apartheid. And so these officers said, we're complaining to you as a council representative. Could you do something about it? So I wrote a letter to Chief Darrell Gates, who called me any number of names, told me to mind my own business. But it turns out I was the only elected official who did anything about it. And I have never to this day figured mm -hmm. out why 
the other elected officials, the other council members. You mean, you're talking about the three African-American council members. Uh, that's right. There were three African-American council members representing the African community, African-American community and me representing. <laughs> and I was the only one who wrote the letter. I still do not understand that because it seemed to me fairly transparent and violates all kinds of city policies. You would think that that would be something to coalesce around. Right. Before I get to the students, we've talked about the incorporation of minorities into city politics. How about the, I don't even know if this is the right word or concept, the disincorporation or the unincorporation. And we talked about strategies for incorporation. What are the strategies for ethnic groups, racial groups, when they know they're going to lose power? I mean. And one example is uh, Jews in LA. Jews in LA were completely excluded in the 1950s, up to the 1950s. Then they gained a lot of political power, so much so that at the point, one point where you were serving on the council, there were eight Jews out seven. of the 15. Seven. Seven. And right now there's only one. Right. Okay. Two. One. No. Well, uh, okay. she claims she's, she swears she's Jewish. Okay. This is an African American. Politically, politically speaking, yes. she got elected because she's African American. That's correct. All right. And That's correct. Yeah, I don't. Well, and the districts have been redrawn by this time. The districts have morphed in such a way that there is really only one district in the city that, as you're picking out who's the most typical representative, you would pick out a Jew. So, what's the? Is there a political strategy among Jews in terms of what to do when they have? because decreasingly are getting less and less uh, positions, not only city council, but you're going to see it in state assembly, Congress, et cetera. Is there a is discussion? Is there a Jewish strategy? Yeah. If there is, I'm not party to it. But I, I They mean, don't invite you to the I'll meeting, tell you what the strategy is. It's, the strategy it's is what, it's the strategy, exactly. It's the strategy that, you know, they're speaking on Passover here, as, as you know, the strategy is the same that it's always been. Uh, Jews are always the minority, and so the strategy is, you know, you cozy up to whoever happens to be in power. You know? now, now let's talk about African Americans, okay? Because even at the height of the uh, African American representation, including Tom Bradley, there was always a sense that no matter how you projected things, African Americans were not going to be the majority of the city of L.A. Right. Never worked. Okay, for Latinos it's different. They're already the majority, and you're just going to see it continuing. So, is there a strategy in terms of how do African Americans exercise uh, political power, political strategy in this era of declining numbers, and they're going to be declining elected offices? What is that strategy? What would be the recommendations? What, from your experience, from your research, from any of the other panelists, what do you, would you recommend to the African-American political class to do, given this situation? It's a foregone conclusion. Right. Well, I think what's happening, there's two things happening. One, African-Americans are scared. They're trying to figure out how to hold on to their seats. There's, and some of the fear is founded, and some of it is not. Um, there's this misconception that we're turning over our seats to Latinos, and so far it will happen, but it hasn't. Has it not, right? Right. Um, in other words, the, the black seats that have been lost were actually lost to non-Latinos, to right, whites, not right, to Latinos. Right, right. exactly. Um, I think that what can happen, and it needs to happen right now, is African Americans, while we still have some power, we're still 17% of voter turnout. Right. So that's a significant number. So while we're, we still have kind of that significant um, uh, voting power, we need to build a coalition, um, reach out to build the coalition. I think once you've lost power and have really nothing to go on, then you're basically, you know, at the mercy of whoever, whoever has the numbers. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll have a partner. Um, I think right now we do. Um, but, but if we don't act now and say we're open to coalition rather than competition, we're, we're never going to be able to get anywhere. Ruth, either. Ricardo, Michael, and then we'll get some questions. I, I think it's worth noting also, though, that the increasingly the divisions we're seeing have more to do with economics than ethnicity. Now, ethnicity is not about to disappear as a factor anytime soon, but um, several people have mentioned the fact that when Mara was talking about the home ownership, what you're starting to find, and I think we'll see more of, um, is more alliances by socioeconomic status. Um, that will play a bigger role and that will cross, to some extent, will cross ethnic lines. Mm -hmm. um, 
having two rigid divisions along that uh, sorted out that way is really no better than having people identified solely by their ethnicity. In some ways, it's worse. Um, but I think that that's going to transpire, and that some of what we will see is that the people, people who are looking for new alliances will, will look um, socially and economically to cross ethnic barriers, because numerically, that's the only way to stay in the game. The, I mean, when you look at the electoral results, the Han victory the first time was in alliance with African Americans and conservative whites in the valley, which was difficult to sustain. So, Ricardo Donato? Well, I mean, Ruth hit, hit the nail on the head when, when she talked about the diversification of the Latinos that are going to be running for office. So, the reality is there will be increasing factions because of interests, either socioeconomic, geographic, what have you. So if you're talking about African Americans, how do they keep themselves from losing uh, power altogether based on the numbers? Is look at where the, the true alliances are, pick out which Latino coalition most you know, resembles what their interests would be. But the results will still be a Latino elected official. Potentially, right? no, because I, I, I mean, what, what yeah. have we seen? What have we seen uh, with well, some of the state answer, assembly? districts, uh, so like let's say uh, Gloria Romero, when she moved up uh, to the Senate, who did she support? She didn't support uh, a Latino to take over the district that was Latino by registration. She supported an Asian American. So I think as Latino politics matures, you, you will see an increasing number of Latinos who are willing to uh, support a non-Latino when it suits the right. coalition better. Right. Otto? I see it in my time to the students. Okay. Yeah, I would just agree. I, I think that uh, the African American populations can be crucial for Latino victories, for Asian victories politically, and that the key is to work to stabilize African American neighborhoods, and that can be done with alliances and coalitions to build affordable housing, to build, uh, to, to lower the mobility, and to increase the, the stability of neighborhoods, and uh, the, the worst part is that it's an uphill battle, from my perspective, because the institutional structure of Los Angeles government is, is punishing for the African American community. You've got 15 city council members, and, and how many people does one representative represent? 250,000. Yeah, it's insane for a city of this size. It's the smallest city council of any city of this size that I know. And it's, a, it's going to be an uphill battle, and alliances are crucial. Vera? Um, I just want to know what we're missing and what we should have been talking about. So. Yeah, questions? Um, I think a snapshot for Latinos, or this is an observation I have. Is this a Let question? A, a, Latinos in a quick observation, then a question. Okay, and, and back east among Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and then Asians, who obviously aren't Latinos, but are from the Caribbean, and African Americans in New York. There seems to be a lot of coalition building there. Obviously, you know, for obvious reasons. Number one, most of those Latinos are mixed with, with African ancestry. And then there seems to be an attitude back there, like Dr. Mark said, with a lot of Jewish activists, that we're going to be perpetually minorities here. Um, how do we deal with each other? And, and then you see another snapshot in the school system in these poor areas, as well as the prison systems, where you don't have those types of sects and, and instinctual tribalism that I, I sense out here in California. Um, out here in California, you do have a distinct difference. Number one, Mexico is huge. So being Mexican is not to solve the only case. You've got, like, like someone said, there's all aspects of being Mexican on top of being Central American. On top of that, you don't have that history of Africanness in, among those Latinos. And then if you look at the school systems and the prison systems, the, the tribalism that develops there is very different than you see among the Latinos back east. What are these trends? What could we learn from back east, maybe, to bring out here? Or is it just because of the numbers and cultural differences? Even though they're both Latinos, Dominicans, uh, Mexicans, and all that, there seems to be a different attitude when dealing with African Americans. Um, could any of you comment on that? Could we learn any, uh, anything in, in those realms? 
So what uh, what can we learn from the experiences of the uh, of urban politics in the East Coast, especially New York and Miami and places like that, where you do have a mixture of African Americans, uh, Latinos, African uh, um, uh, immigrant from Haiti and the Dominican, etc. Well, we had a panel all about this. I think it was our first panel of the of the semester where. Um, we had a bunch of grass, you know, people representing grassroots organizations or nonprofits, and their message was grassroots organizations, ethnic based organizations, I think their phrase was we need to scale up. We need to, you know, stop just thinking about our own constituency and think about what alliances, what are what are the, the shared interests that we have that we can then mobilize our um, particular constituencies around and get them to join up with with other other groups. And so, you know, in this case it would be um, I guess pushing the, you know, in the case of the, the immigrant mobilization, sort of pushing them to say, okay, you've been successful um, mobilizing this group, this own constituency. Now, can you scale up? Can the leaders, some of the you know the grassroots leaders who help mobilize this, can they scale up and begin to cross those barriers and and you know reach out to other groups based on shared in, you know perceived shared interest? Melina, I think I mean one of the things just really quickly is there there's a. I don't think it's true that there is no African ancestry among Mexicans, especially if you look at um, Oaxaca and other places. So there is African ancestry, although it's nowhere near the degree of Dim right, Dominican Republic. Right. Right. Well, I think some 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 Mexicans do recognize it. So. Um, I don't want to say that it doesn't exist altogether, but I think what we are missing on the West Coast that they seem to be getting on the East Coast um, is that whites also have a racial identity. And I think if you think of, for instance, why did Han win in 2001, I think for African Americans, we kind of forgot that. And I think that if you think about what happened, um, what was his name, Ferrer? in New York? Yeah, um, Freddie Ferrer. Right, Ferrer, when he was able to get the African American um, leaders and votes, you know, voters to really support him, what that was about is not just highlighting common interests, but also say what interests kind of <coughs> threaten our, uh, our advancement. And so I think we need to think about that, drawing attention to the racial identity of whites. Ruth? Well, I grew up in New York, mm -hmm. so go ahead. No, no, no. Um, I, I did grow up in New York, but of course I left quite a while ago, and a lot of this has happened since. But there are a couple of interesting things about New York. First of all, I think that there is a much more pervasive sense of the city's history as one of waves of immigrants who came and then were ultimately assimilated. And although clearly there have been lots of immigrants here in Los Angeles, lots of them have been from other parts of the US. And that's as much of the history as the Mexican origins of California, which we must never forget. Um, that, but there's some other interesting things. In the 90s, some early 90s, I think, New York City changed its city charter uh, as we did here. And there's some significant differences. In, in the New York City situation, they increased the city council to 50-something representatives. I think it's 51. And they are divided up now. So there's Dominican districts, Puerto Rican districts, uh, every kind of ethnic identity you can think of, there is a district. And those people actually elect a member of the city council. Here in Los Angeles, we had charter reform, which I, by the way, I did not support, uh, and I do not think it has been a success. Um, and what we created was an opportunity for, um, with these neighborhood councils, we created an opportunity for people to become very parochial about their own neighborhoods, but we did not put them in a position as they did in New York, where somebody has a responsibility not only for their own neighborhoods, but for the city as a whole. So I think that we are actually going backwards here. We are actually encouraging people to, to think very parochial, parochially instead of looking at the city as a whole and our common concerns like what we're breathing. Um, 
but, but I think more of it is that history of waves of people. Everybody growing up in New York knows that there was a period when there were songs like No Irish Need Apply, and then the Irish got established, and then the Italians were the bad guys, and then the, bad, the Italians got established, and the Irish were still there, and they seemed to manage okay, and the next wave of people came in. So it's kind of routine. One of my favorite things about New York is walking down the street and seeing a couple of young Puerto Rican girls talking using Yiddish expressions. They have absolutely no idea these are Yiddish expressions or that Yiddish is Jewish. It's part of life. It's part of New York. That's when you know you've got real integration. Anybody? Yeah, right here. Um, my Let me repeat the question just because we need it for the recording. Okay. And so uh, how is uh, hip hop music and just music in general, how's that going to unfold in terms of mobilizing and encouraging? And then second for the rest of the panel is how, what role can we play in terms of the Latino African American uh, tension, especially in the schools, and maybe how we frame that. Uh, Otto, you can talk a little bit about, about that. Can I just say one thing? How come white America got grouped in that question? How come um, white America got equated with the Bush White House? That's my only. Well, I think I didn't vote for him. <laughs> Ruth? Okay, anyway. <laughs> Just speaking to um, your question about hip hop and kind of corporate owned media, that's one of the reasons why I kind of say there's two streams of hip hop. There is the stream that, you know, tries to promote things like materialism, misogyny, um, those things that will, you know, maintain the system as it stands. And of course, Viacom, which owns every major, um, what, MTV, VH1, what else do they own? All of them, BET, right? They own BET now, right? And billboards and right. radio stations. So if we think about that, we can't depend on MTV to, to show Dead Prez videos. Well, there's one being shown now, but. Um, <laughs> We can't depend on them to, to, to show videos or highlight artists who really go against their interests. And there's a movement to put pressure on um, the corporations, um, but I think it's a wrong strategy. I think basically what we need to do and what we, we're starting to see happen is we're starting to depend on alternative media outlets. So if we think about Divine Forces Radio on Friday nights on KPFK, you know, that's where you'll hear Dead Press, that's where you'll hear the coup. If you think about the usage of the internet, um, I think that's, you know, kind of how things circulate. I know when Immortal Technique first came out, I was asking my students, and I'd have like two students who knew who he was, but even if you think about his strategy, he says, burn and download as much as you can, just blast it so everybody hears my message, right? And so if we get to that, I think that's really how you will kind of um, see this revolution take place through hip hop. Um, we can't depend on the corporate media to do it for us because why would they want the, the um, transformation to occur? They won't. Yeah. Hey, Otto, maybe I can get you to talk about maybe the same thing, but from the Spanish language perspective. 
uh, Parencio, who's one of the wealthiest people in America, owns Univision and owns many of these radio stations and is one of the biggest supporters of uh, Republicans, Bush, Schwarzenegger, etc. He gives hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in campaign contributions to the Republicans. Yet he continues to uh, use Univision and allow it to have this message which oftentimes is anti-Republican. I mean, how, how do you, uh, so here corporations See, still see it in their business to, or, or benefit to allow this message to come out. I Not nowhere near as radical as what we're talking about over here, but you know, still. He, he's a capitalist before he's a Republican. <laughs> I think all these con conglomerations, I mean, if playing Kill Whitey is going to make them a million dollars, they're going to play it. It doesn't matter because they're not concerned yeah. about the, the consequences. Well, they also, they they also believe with, with some mm -hmm. evidence to prove it, that if they spend enough on their candidates, it doesn't matter what the message is. They're going to is. take the money they make so, and spend it on Republicans. Yeah. I got time for one more question. Yeah. Oh. Um, briefly, I'm wondering, and whoever wants to ask this is great, um, I'm wondering a lot of the, the a lot of what um, the response has been to the various marches in LA and the other cities um, these last few weeks on the right has been um, kind of in line with Sam Huntington's thesis of um, there's in his you know Google PDR book is there is this you know critical mass of Latino population that has grown too large to be assimilated into you know mainstream American culture and you know therefore the the right is very much afraid of this and you know they pointed a lot to the um, the display of um, flags from the countries of origin of the, the various immigrants um, during these protests as opposed to American flags and, and played this up in a big way. And I'm wondering, um, you know, both your thoughts on Sam Huntington's thesis, but more importantly, what the appropriate way for the, the immigrant groups is um, to combat that, that viewpoint. So actually, this is a good way to kind of uh, end, end the session by having you kind of respond in terms of the, the, the question. It, it, the response to mobilization from the right has been kind of following on, on Huntington. Um, Mary, why don't we start with you and work our way this way in, in terms of uh, what, what should be the response to that, to that uh, Republican or conservative response that's been laid out by Huntington? I don't know. I mean, I, my fear was, I mean, as soon as, as soon, I actually, before I even saw the images, I heard from somebody that, um, boy, they've unfurled a, uh, unfurled a bunch of Mexican flags. This was on the 25th. And I thought, oh, no, didn't they learn? Didn't they learn from 1994 when, you know, the front page, there could be one Mexican flag in the crowd, and that's what, that's what the media is going to focus on, and that's what's going to get blown up, and it's just going to create this um, potential backlash. Michael? Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think that what we've seen just in the past few weeks, and certainly the emergence of a, a new narrative, proves the, the futility of Huntington's concept of civilization or culture, or what it is. I mean, he has a very static concept, and culture is something that's always being negotiated. And in this case, it's not that... <laughs> Hey, the, the student was right. Corporate America controls the media. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being blocked out. I think if you get closer, perhaps. I mean, what is what I think is fascinating that you have seen is that in this period of serious negotiation that we're going through right now, what is being successful is is not a rejection of what is the American culture, but it's incorporation. I mean, what is working is that you know what are immigrants? They're hard workers. They have families. You know, they care about family values. In other words, they're, they're American. So they fit into the broader narrative of what it means to be an American. And that's going, I, I think that's the direction that it's going to go in. And that's, uh, it's, it's going to change American culture because it's going to include groups that it, it didn't previously. And there's always going to be groups that are excluded. And we've got to renegotiate that. Otto? I guess I took a, a more, more uh, narrow scope of time on this. And I saw that by Monday in, uh, in Washington and the other uh, demonstrations on Monday that uh, there were more American flags, that, the, that, the, that there were uh, pledges of allegiance in both Spanish and English. 
and that the, there was a, a clear effort, a very rapid response nationally, which blew me out of the water. I could not understand how that, I want to ask Ricardo and all the rest of you, how this is getting uh, transferred to respond precisely to that, that message uh, that uh, Salvadoran flags and, and Mexican flags are going to play badly in Peoria. So I think it's, I look very positively at the response of people uh, who are organizing nationally. Ricardo. Well, I mean, the, the message was clear from a lot of the radio personalities. And uh, the one here in Los Angeles, uh, Piolini, basically specifically said this. Look, whatever one of you does that's bad is going to get replayed over and over. So stay on point, wear the white shirts, get the flags. It, it wasn't until the youth that we actually saw more of these other flags because they, also, they didn't have that cohesive message that was being relayed to them the way, the way it was through the radio. What I think, uh, the fact that there are so many American flags and you're still gonna have the right-wing fact faction of the uh, conservative, uh, among conservatives that are basically saying, look, Oh, they don't have enough American flags. They're, so they're still going like, to, before it was like, oh, it's only Mexican flags. This was in 94. Now it's, oh, but they still had some, you know. So they're, they're going to pick some of that stuff up. But I think you had it right on. The fact that there are competing messages now, that it's, it's not just the negative one, but the positive one, I think it's actually going to alienate the conservatives that are going to say, well, what else do you want? I mean, it's like, yeah, they're gonna, the, the conservatives are going to get more marginalized than, you know, than was the case in 94. Ruth. Well, I, uh, one of the things that I learned in my years on the city council is that everybody I met was unhappy because Los Angeles had changed from the way it was the day they moved here. <laughs> um, and, and I believe it. I think that fear of change is enormous. It's very powerful. And it almost doesn't matter what the change is. People many, many people are frightened of change. And what I think you, we see when people, when you see all this backlash stuff and they say, well, it's, they're not American, it's not the American way. The American way, in fact, is very different in different places. And it has many different aspects to it, some of which are by no means peculiar to being American. I mean, taking care, loving your family is neither American nor not American. It just is, it's a human thing. So I think that, um, I agree with what's been said so far. I think that the, the uh, recognition by people who are demonstrating that they can put across a message that says, we are your neighbors. We are, your, we are also your gardeners, your nannies, and, all, and we pick your produce, and we, are, we do all the things that you can't live without. Um, but it's still hard for people to face that who, who don't want to face it. But they're not going to have a choice. And so the changes that I see between 87 or 94 and now are the recognition that there is no choice here. It's only a question of how to accommodate the fact that the, the U.S. population today doesn't look the way it did in the 1950s. It just doesn't. And even in some parts of the Northeast in particular, there are towns and states that are trying to figure out how to attract immigrants. Mm -hmm. State of Vermont, for example, where all the, all the trendies who can afford it out of New York and Boston are buying land to retire, doesn't have any young people. They don't have enough Vermont-generated college students because there's no jobs in Vermont, so everybody's leaving. So they're looking for people to come in. That changes, Vermont politics are a little different from the rest of the country too, but it changes the way you look at things. There are parts of the Midwest and parts of the uh, Appalachian Mountains where they, and Detroit, where they need people to come in. So there are changes coming that have nothing to do with political ideology. They have to do with economic survival. And, and economic survival probably trumps political ideology in the end. But it's going to be, it's not going to be easy because people really are terrified of change. I don't know why all change seems so awful, but you can see it in people my age worrying about getting wrinkles. You know, it's, 
there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to get older, not younger. And, and the same thing is true of the city of Los Angeles. It's going to mature. It's not going to go back to its, uh, the condition it was in in 1950. Melina. I think what your question really kind of raises is, you know, what responsibility emerging populations have to make the norm feel comfortable. And, you know, is um, really assimilation a requirement to be recognized as um, what Otto was saying, a human being? Do you have to completely um, assimilate to, to what the people in power say you need to do? Um, is there a right to a racial or ethnic identity? Um, and then I guess with regard to Ricardo's comment, I would wonder if those young people just simply didn't get the message or if it's kind of a form of rebellion and saying, you know, I mean, of course, some of them didn't get the message, but how many of them did get the message, but say, I don't care that that's the message. I have a right to be Mexican and still be a human being and American, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess I'd just leave it there. Yeah. And thank you, student, for holding out even though it's past seven. Let's give them a round of applause.